Hello and welcome to another episode of Educational. This is Roy. This is Terry. So we are a podcast. We've uh, we've had a website around for quite some time where we did some writing and uh, some original content, some curated content on the aging process, how we can... Uh, you know, help those around us that are aging, how we can help caregivers, and also how we can help ourselves through this aging process. So uh, we're excited. We're going to chronicle our journey. Uh, Both myself and Terry have aging parents. So we've always got uh, the thrills and excitement (laughs) of new things coming up from day to day. Uh, Luckily, uh, you know, my parents and Terry's mother, both in good health, uh, relatively for their age and so it, the the issues are minor but sometimes even the minor things if you just know somebody else is going through it how to navigate it those are things that we're going to uh, hopefully talk about just instances that come up in our life but also uh, we do want to extend invitations because we want professionals in the aging field to come on here uh, we do want to get uh, people that are going through the process, either aging or as caregivers, to come on and tell us their story. Uh, we just feel like that uh, there are a lot of people going through some struggle to do with aging at this point, And we want to let you know you're not there alone, and we want to reach out and help you. Uh, you know, a little bit about my professional background, I have consulted in the senior living industry for the last 20 years. Uh, I am a gerontologist by uh, education and um, have worked as uh, a volunteer long-term care ombudsman here in Tarrant County uh, in the past. So I've been kind of in the aging field for quite some time and so this is a passion for me for sure. And um, Anyway, today we're going to get on with the show. Today uh, we have an awesome guest, Teresa, and I'm going to let uh, uh, Terry introduce her. Yeah, welcome, Teresa Murr. She is an author, coach, and a speaker who helps individuals and organizations find their strengths, realize their life vision, and build exceptional experiences to become empowered and live life to the fullest. She is a creative, transformational life artist and was a physical therapist. Um, for about 35 years, I believe. And the, she is an author of a book called The Art of Assisting Aging Parents. So welcome, Teresa. We are so happy to have you. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Terry and Roy. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, if you don't mind, tell, just tell us a little bit about how you, um, how you got to the book process, but you know, just a little of your um, background and how you got there. Sure, mm-hmm. yes. Um, yeah, I started in physical therapy uh, 35 years ago. And I, I noticed for myself, although I love the profession and I can't imagine my life without it, but um, I have a creative side to me. And um, so what happened during my physical therapy years was that I was introduced to multidisciplinary group therapy. And at that point, I was really able to bring my creativity to my therapy. And I loved it because the patients were thriving in this, um, in these group approaches that we did to bring, you know, therapeutic activities. We brought a lot of fun, a lot of challenge. And um, we also brought, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy in, in as, as needed. So it was a wonderful experience, not only for the patients, but also for me, you know, and it really helped me grow as a therapist. And um, about, it took about 13 years before um, I decided I was going to write a book about it. And I thought I would dedicate this first book to caregivers and the aging, because, you know, I, I saw the problems that were happening you know, not only in the therapy world, but I started um, helping my own aging parents and just to see the challenges. And there were so many people coming up to me and my sisters saying, what do I do with my aging parents? You know, so it's not just one person, it's a multitude of people that just don't know, uh, you know, how to solve problems. And sometimes they don't even know the problems associated with aging. Yeah, where to go, where to start. Yeah, and that was uh, kind of why the educational started, especially, you know, for me, is that pe- when people find out that you're in any part of the field to do with aging, 
It's a ton of questions, you know, how to navigate Medicare or how to, you know, navigate the getting the insurance to get the physical therapy to stay at home, move to a facility. I mean, there's just so many questions that revolve around that. Yes, yes. And, you know, I take the approach, um, it's like a proactive approach. You know, instead of reacting to the aging and having to come up with the solutions, um, I take a proactive approach where I put in my book all the tools that you need for your healthy lifestyle strategies. You know, I put in a couple educational theories so people can communicate well with their parents and with the um, health professionals. And you, you know, as you guys have been in the aging scene, you know, you know how many people there are to communicate with, right. you know, as you, as you assist your parents and you've seen other people do this, you know, multiple times. So that, and then the benefits of group, the group um, interactions. And I know we're seeing this a lot right now with the COVID and the isolation. And I've actually sat in on a couple of, of um, uh, trainings just recently, just this week. And there were trainings from like the National Association of Rehab and um, another, I think the other one was just a Zoom training and they were kind of highlighting the telemedicine, but they both noted that caregivers and families are so needed in this process right. of, you know, getting through the aging process and how many people are in isolation right now and they're suffering so much more because they can't be with their family and their caregivers, you know? so. It really is a problem, and um, I think if you hit the, you know, hit it proactively, you know, it's it's like you get on board almost before you need to, and you start this, you know, aging process, and um, yeah, you just really you optimize the function of your body, brain, and spirit. That's yeah. that's my goal. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's so important because uh, if, as in the past we typically wait till there's an event that happens and then it's the stress of the event is usually traumatic by itself. But then we add on a little stress of, well, I need this information or I need to do this process and I need it to happen right this minute. And unfortunately just not the way that most things happen in life, but in aging, especially it just seems like it takes forever. So I think that proactive plan and then people like myself who are getting to, you know, it's hard to <laughs> be of a certain age is, you know, there are things that we can do proactively for ourselves in order, uh, you know, we kind of a term we've been throwing around lately is, you know, we don't want our uh, lifespan to outpace our health span. And so, you know, we want to try to match those up in some way that we can be happy and enjoy older life. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm amazed a lot when I look around at people that are in their seventies and eighties that are still popping around and, you know, getting around good. Cause growing up, it was, it, this may be a little bit, um, over, dr 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 over dramatized, <laughs> but you know, when I was growing up, it seemed like when you hit 65, it was boom. All you know? downhill from there. Yeah. You know, it was the cane and Walker and you didn't do anything. <laughs> and now, you know, we've got these people that are, uh, you know, eighties and nineties that are out there driving and you see them in a, a restaurant. You know, when I meet people, they're like, Hey, this is my mother. She's like 95. I'm like, wow, I can't even believe it. Mm -mm. My mom is 86 and she is, she's still driving. She said she'll quit at 90. We thought mm -hmm. we might send a, D, a letter from the DMV saying, okay, oh. you're 90, <laughs> can't do it anymore. This is, this is the cutoff. Yes. <laughs> Don't say anything. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I totally know what you mean. I, you know, starting in physical therapy 35 years ago, it was unusual to see somebody in their 90s. Yeah. And now we're seeing active 90 year olds and, you know, into the, into the hundreds now, you know, and, and still active yeah. and it's, it's amazing. But, um, it, yeah, due to some good education, I think al along the way that's yeah. helped a lot. Yeah. I was, uh, at a, this was a, um, an assisted living community at in um, Lafayette, Louisiana that I was at. It's been a few years ago, but they were doing an opening. So we were down there uh, helping them out, doing some tours and stuff. And um, I, I was very surprised to find they had like uh, 50 of the initial residents that had moved in. 
there were still 10 that were driving and working and they were still living a full life, even though, you know, they wanted a little bit more security. They, they didn't want to cook as much, but they still lived a very active life. So it's -hmm. encouraging. It's encouraging, but we still have to take care of ourselves in order to make it to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so the art of assisting aging parents, you have a four step method for successful aging. And what do you call that? Experience, experience, yeah, experience. Mm-hmm. And, yes. and what, what is that about? Well, um, and that the four step method is a, it's, it gives you a sequence and it gives a caregiver like, um, kind of a method to use and a sequence so they don't get overwhelmed. And so first I teach um, like six healthy lifestyle strategies that are really non-negotiable. And it's really for all of us, non-negotiable. We have to have the right nutrition. We have to get the hydration. We really all need to be doing the deep breathing, the meditation and mindfulness. Yeah, get that eight hours of sleep and um, do the exercise for your brain and your body. So um, those are the first things I teach and I want people to practice those. And a lot of people don't know that meditation and mindfulness actually grows your brain and it keeps your brain healthy, you know? And, you know, yeah, just to know that, um, you know, people are like, well, yeah, I want a better brain as I age. And um, yeah, something that's, it's so simple, it's so easy and it's so effective, you know? And, and the deep breathing can change your whole body. It can change you from a state of anxiety and, and anxiety can lead into depression to bringing you to a state of calm and you're able to um, think and make decisions. So these things are, are, are easy, but they're very, very powerful for your body. Yeah. So I teach those first. And then I, teach, I do teach the benefits of group interaction. Um, it's so healthy to be with people, you know, face to face. And now all the research is coming out to tell us that, you know, we emit hormones into our body when we're face to face with people. Hmm. And we, we, um, we, you know, are more empathetic when we're face to face. And um, also, you know, you, you can become a teacher when you're face to face. And just think about the, um, the confidence and, you know, that that will bring an aging person when they can be like a confidant to somebody or teach right. somebody a new skill. Yeah. So, being in groups is just huge, you know, for your health. So I teach that. And then I teach a couple educational theories that I think are really important. Um, and I've used them in my therapy world, you know, for all these years. So I teach that. And then, then we go into this four step method. And the first step is helping your parents find their strengths. So um, I do this like by conversation, you, you bring your parents in some, to some conversation. And they can tell you some stories about um, what they did in the past that, um, you know, some obstacles they overcame and, um, and what their strong points are. So you, you listen to those stories and then you pick out these words and it might be, you know, perseverance or um, courage or uh, generosity, you know, something like that. And then you take those words and you use them with your parents and just continue to build them up. You know, we all want to work from a a place of strength and we have to, you know, to get through the aging process. You know? right, right. It's, it's yeah, really uncharted territory for all of us, you know? And um, the second step is finding your life vision. And, you know, I never want anybody to lose that because that's what gets us out of bed in the morning. You know, we, yeah. we have to have that purpose, you know, and maybe it's your family or maybe it's, um, Maybe you had a career that was so important to you. You loved it. You had this passion for it. And so you take this, you know, or maybe you're a sports enthusiast. You take this life vision and you tweak it a little bit and say, well, what can, what can my parent do now that makes them feel good and get out of bed in the morning and hit life, you know, hit the ground running every day, you know? So you work on that. And um, in that same step, in step two, I have people set goals, you know, so, so they have something to work for. And um, the, the uh, fourth step is uh, the concrete activities that get you to those goals. So that's where you pull in all these health tools and, um, you know, the exercise and things like that, that bring you, you know, towards your goals. Yeah. And then finally, it's the assessment and the reassessment, which we all have to do on an everyday basis, yeah. you know. And, am, I, am I making, yeah. yeah, making my goals? Am I working towards them? Do I need to tweak them a little bit? 
or, um, you know, or like just what, what direction am I going in? Yeah. And it's kind of a method that never ends. It's kind of a circular thing. Once you get done with it, you just kind of start over, start you know, at you the just, beginning. You keep upgrading or sometimes you have to downgrade, you know, that can happen too. Yeah. So, yeah. And you, um, uh... An interesting point that you bring up is the, you know, who we may have been in our youth or our accomplishments and our goals and things like that. Because, uh, you know, as an ombudsman, that was one thing that we worked on. And, and you know, when we talk about uh, assisting our aging parents, it could be us and it could be other caregivers. And so the, kind of the message I have is that um, a lot of staff would talk about people by their um, affliction like hey there's a lady in uh, 3a with dementia she needs this or that or that lady in 4b uh, with incontinence you need to go down and take her something you know and it came to light um, because one of the ladies was um, she had been a local school superintendent she was well published she had two or three books she had magazines articles very well accomplished lady but we had reduced her to the lady with dementia and uh you know so that was one thing that we um really tried to stress with the the non-family caregiver was everybody has had a life everybody's had a story we need to get to know that more so we can um at least address them on an individual basis i think it's so very important it's a lot of it is just the respect and the dignity factor yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought I, I thought I was interrupting you if you were going to say something. Um, I was. I. This may be out of left field, but I for for Christmas last year I got my mom a um, a book. It, it's it's called Storybook, and what they did was they it was a subscription, and they sent her a question a week. It, it's kind of overkill because I'm actually doing it, but um, a question a week, and I got to pick pick the questions, um, and you know, just uh, what were you like as a child? What were your parents like? What was your best job? Um, what is your what would you like to be remembered for? I mean, anything you want, and then at the end of a year, um, they they make a book, a hard book a hardcover book and they send it to her. So I'm in the process of doing that right now, but you know, I'll call her and I'll ask her the questions, even though she gets the emails and I'll mm -hmm. ask the questions and then I'll, you know, type in what she tells me. And it's been very, uh, you know, I've, I've just learned even more about her, even, even though you, you hear the stories over the years, um, you know, I've just learned so much about her and that, that was just something that was really, cool that I wanted to mention. yeah that's a great I, engagement I tool that. yeah mm -hmm. it, it is yeah. And, and what a great legacy to leave for the grandkids you know so they can know their grandmother yeah. or you know yeah and she, she and you know and at this point I mean she's 86 and she lives in a retirement uh, and she lives in an apartment and in, in, in independent living um, in a retirement um, center and um, she you know, she sometimes she just feels like she's not worthy of anybody's attention, and you know the grandkids are all everybody's living their lives, and you know if mm -hmm. if she doesn't if they don't call her, you know that's a big thing. They have to call her. I'm like, mom, the phone goes both ways. You need to do this. But the social interaction is just really it's so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I will. I, yes. I'll just chime in on that. Like my grandmother, um, you know, she wanted to stay at home because she wanted to be close to her church. She wanted to be with her friends, and you know what we kind of convinced her over time was, well, you're not driving anymore. You know, most of your friends are gone or living elsewhere, and uh, y'all don't ever make it to church anymore. So why don't we try this? And so once we put her, I don't want to say put her. Once she <laughs> moved to an independent that social aspect is it's so underrated but it's so important because mm -hmm. she flourished i mean you know you have to call ahead when we'd go over there to see her because she was never at home she was 
I don't know, puzzle room, somebody else's room playing dominoes or cards. I mean, those ladies were into a lot of mischief. And so, uh, you know, they were always out running around. But I, I just feel like that's that is one thing that we give up when we age a lot. And it's still so important, probably more important. Yeah, mom, yeah. mom is always, she is playing bridge, especially during COVID. I mean, they can't get together any longer, but she's doing it online. And the fact that she's figuring out how to do that is blowing my mind. So I'm just letting it go. I mean, I know nothing about bridge. So, but right. she is, uh, I mean, two, two times a day, almost every day. It's crazy. Yeah, that is so nice. And I tell people, you know, get back in your groups as soon as you can after this pandemic ends get back in your groups or in, and if you don't are if you aren't in any groups get in groups and try to maintain your groups now online yeah. if you can yeah because it really is that important well and we're lucky with technology because it's not yeah. the same i get that but we still have the facetime on the phone we have you know ipads computers we have a lot of ways to connect which i think is you know it's really cool just like uh, you know, Terry and her daughter, her daughter is, uh, lives in California and has been in Hawaii for the last six months, I guess. And, uh, they get, they, you know, FaceTime all the time, which I think it's awesome because they get to see each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think we just have to adopt those, you know, we have to, may have to have a little more patience with mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. But, you know, those are things that we can adopt for them to uh, at least try to keep them engaged with the family and then maybe their friends as well. Yeah. And everybody should be able to take, you know, five, five minutes, uh, you know, five, five, ten minutes a week. Just call and check on, you know, whoever, whoever your family member mm -hmm. is. You know, it doesn't it doesn't take that much effort to do yeah. that. Um, and it's nice to always keep in touch. And find out what's going on because you know you never know when something's going to come up mm -hmm. right right yeah i know a lot of people have been creative i know one of my friends and unfortunately she lost her husband mm -hmm. to covid and um she has four children and they're just young adults you know so it's very devastating for all of them but um, for my friend's birthday, they all got on the Zoom call and they did that rock painting, you know, where you paint the rocks, you know, they did that. You know. Oh, that's <laughs> cute. Yeah. And some people have done the pumpkin carving, um, you know, and really getting your family together. This can be a, really be a multi-generational, um, just an, an excellent event to get the whole family together, you know, maybe at a holiday and just do some extended, like, you know, even decorating the Christmas tree is good exercise for, you know, your aging parents, um, making that meal, um, you know, some of the favorites, like maybe the ginger snap cookies or, you know, things that really smell, things that really, um, you know, are sensory stimulating, yes. you know, beautiful, beautiful pictures or views or drive around and see the Christmas lights or, um, you know, have that meal, have the, the smells and the taste and talk about the past reminisce yeah. because reminiscing again is good for your body and your brain. And it can take out some of the anxiety and it can give you some really good positive feelings of, of good times in the past yeah. too, you know. So um, never underestimate the power of even getting your family together as a group, you know, or, or your little bubble that you have right now that you can be with you right. know, during this time. Um, very, very powerful. Yeah, and you, uh, another thing that's um, I think is taking a toll on the caregivers, especially, is that stress component because um, you know there's some of us, some not me, some Terry's. There's some Terry's that are <laughs> <laughs> you know kind of in no that <laughs> kind of in that uh, the sandwich generation. Now her kids are a little older; she still has one, you know, in tw young twenties. But you know, there, like you said with your other friend, there are people that maybe still have young kids that need a lot of attention and now all of a sudden mom or dad or even grandma and grandpa uh now they're needing a lot of your attention too and so they're and i'm gonna throw a lot of things out there at you and you can just kind of go with uh, w which one you would want to dive into but you know first off especially for the uh, very high acuity uh 
pa- patients, I guess, a better way, the you know people that are being cared for, the caregiver will about 60 to 70 percent of the time, the caregiver will pass away before the person that they're caring for. So, you know, that's one um, a lot of times the family member has to quit work. And so now that adds that financial burden on to, you know, the already the stress and, uh, you know, with COVID has compounded that because it's harder to bring people in. It's harder to get into communities. A lot of families don't want to, uh, you know, even look at congregate type living because of, you know, all the the COVID ramifications right this minute. So anyway, that the, the caregivers really have to t- learn to take care of themselves because the, the message is that they cannot give if they're in bad health themselves. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. And that is so true. And I touch on that in my book. Um, a lot of people wonder if my book is for caregivers or the aging. Yeah. <laughs> and I say, well, you know, you really can't separate them. It, mm-hmm. it just goes together, you know, but yes, the caregivers, I heard the statistic that caregivers are dying 60% faster than those they care for. Right. And that is very alarming. It's very scary. And that just means we really all have to take care of ourselves, right. you know? And um, I know that I teach people how to do this, how to do the self-care. And one thing I would say, the first thing is to delegate You've got to delegate responsibilities, you know. You have to maybe have that family meeting and see who can help, you know, who has the resources, who's got the time, right. who has the special talents to help mom and dad through this aging process. And then really make a list of things that, you know, all the siblings can come together and do, you know, for mom and dad. But really all the did not just fall on one person, you know, even if they are the primary primary caregiver, they still have to have a break. Yeah. So that's the second thing I tell them after you delegate, you need to take breaks. You need to take breaks every day. You need to have a couple hours for yourself, you know, at least. And then you need to take, um, then, you know, it comes to be about taking a weekend away, you yeah. know, just step away from caregiving. Yeah. And then get a good vacation or two in every year so that you can stay healthy you know, you need to stay in groups, you need to take care of yourself, you know, you need to eat right. You know? And so many caregivers just get into the cycle of, you know, having to help somebody that they totally ignore their own self and their right. own health, you yep. know. And and I hate that with, you know, the sandwich generation, you know, when I was in, in that generation, I still had goals, you know, I, I'm 60 years old and I'm starting a new business right now, you know. I have, I have a lot of goals and I love how this um, health professional I talked to this week, she said, you know, we all have a lot of goals until we get sick and then we only have one goal and that is to get better, right, you know? Right. So I, I don't want anybody to lose their goals, their life vision. You know, you really have to pay attention to yourself, you know, as you care give. And um, the third thing I say, too, is, you know, you have to pamper yourself a little bit, pamper yourself, you know, go get the go get the facial, go get the pedicure, go go get a massage. Are you go, listening go to, to this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you got to make a wish list here. <laughs> right. yeah, I wish I could do this. <laughs> right. But yeah, but yeah, you do have to pamper yourself and um, do something for yourself. Yeah. You know, that's really important. So you, so you feel good. Yeah, because there's the emotional aspect, too. I mean, it's draining physically and there's all that. But, you know, one thing that what we would find, especially in, uh, you know, when we looked at uh, non-related caretakers, is that when they had to work longer and longer hours, if they were pulling doubles, trying to cover shifts, most of the abusive situations, and I don't mean necessarily physical, but maybe verbal And sometimes abuse is not as bad as what it can be as much as it's just snapping or, uh, you know, being quick or or blowing off what they're yeah short tempered. You know, there's a lot of things like that that I think that we have to protect ourselves from, you know, by getting that respite because we don't want to act out to, you know, the people that we're caring for, for sure. Acting kind and keep the vicious cycle going. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. My sisters, mm -hmm. my sisters I and I. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, that's good. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, when I, I was working, I, I actually went to Kansas City for a couple of years to help my mom. And my husband was just very generous to say, just go help your mom. And he knew I was kind of looking for a traveling job. I wanted to kind of split my time because um, I'm always was always looking for another job in my creative, you know, creative world. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so I, I actually had two physical therapy jobs in Kansas City and taking care of my mom. And we ended up moving in, her into assisted living and independent living. But, um, you know, I had to have patients all day for my patients at the hospitals, you know. Right. And I gave them, you know, that's just my nature is I give them everything, you know, at the hospital. But then, like, then I would go help my mom in the evening. And sometimes I noticed I didn't have as much patience for her as I did, you know, for right. the ones at the hospital. And that, you know, they kind of, yeah, I mean, it made me feel bad. I, I was like, come on, Teresa, you can have more, a little bit more patience with your mom. You know, not that it never, it never got to a bad point, but you know what I mean? Yes. It's just yeah. so um, common so with I, family members and, you know, when you, yeah. after you're out working so much, so long, all those long hours and you get home and it's like somebody's just breathes wrong and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. You know, I just, um, you know, it, it was just one of those things where, you expect a lot from your family. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you just do. Yeah. <clears throat> the other thing that you brought up, I or wrote down was uh, the breathing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is such a, we actually um, were talking to some people uh, there in, um, what is it? A, a, like a traditional Eastern health, health and wellness space where they do, you know, a lot of more natural type things and um that was something that we got off on was the breathing so it's good to talk about that <clears throat> how important that is not only for the caregivers but for the um for those that are aged as well because i know i find myself not breathing or breathing very shallow and so i have to really mindfully think about and i used to have a, a sign over my desk that said take a breath or breathe and you know, people would kind of laugh and say, well, you got to be reminded to breathe. And I'm like, yeah, I really do. Because on more than one occasion, I've had people, you know, when I was out doing stuff that people would say, it, it, it's okay to take a breath. I, you know, whenever I, and it doesn't necessarily be stressful. I could just, if I'm intent, I will notice I will hold my breath. But um, I think for relieving the stress, there's so many functions of our body that we can control with breathing. And you had mentioned earlier brain health. I mean, deep breathing for brain health, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, actually, your, your brain re requires a fifth of the oxygen that you bring into your body. You know, so and you, we, we know, like, and your, your other organs require the oxygen too, but we know we can't live without our brain. If we don't, if, say we're, we're, we're without oxygen for what, like seven to 10 minutes, um, our brain is that dependent right. that it will die in that right. amount of time. So um, you can think of that and you can think of the other organs in your body that require that oxygen. So yeah, deep breathing is very uh, vital for that. And it also, it calms down your nervous system. You can take yourself from that fight and fight or flight, you know, uh, system down to a relaxed, um, calm system. And just by just doing the deep breathing, your body will relax. And in fact, if there's a night that I can't get to sleep, I will practice the deep breathing. And sometimes in the morning I wake up and I think, gosh, I don't even remember, you know, doing that yeah. whole exercise because yeah. I fell asleep. Yeah. I mean, it really is, it really is powerful. And um, yeah, I teach people diaphragmatic breathing, which is the belly breathing. It's where your, um, you know, your belly goes, goes up. I have people put their hand on their chest and their hand on their belly and then work on, on that belly breathing. Right. And if anybody's interested, it's, it's on the internet, you know, I mean, you can Google it, you can do YouTube and you'll find diaphragmatic breathing. And, um, there's one that's called four square where you, you inhale for the count of four, hold it for the count of four, exhale for the count of four, and hold it for the count of four. Hmm. So if you can just think of a square, 
And that's sometimes that's the one I'll do um, right before I go to, or if I'm trying to go to sleep, or if I want a good night's sleep, I'll yeah. do the four square. And I tell you, it just just takes your body into a different yeah. state. Yeah, yeah and it, it kind of goes along, I think. Well, for me, I think um, it kind of leads me into mindfulness and maybe even the meditation because I know when you know when i can make myself stop and do meditation that breathing is an important part for me to uh because i i guarantee i'll say okay i'm going to meditate and then i'm thinking of five things that i need to do or want to do or should be doing and the way that i can bring myself back into that uh, mindlessness or you know my neutralness is just breathe and I, and really concentrate like you were saying on taking it in, making it go down into your stomach, and then the release of it. When I can concentrate on that, I am much more able to meditate like I should. But the mindfulness, uh, you know, Terry brought up a great point the other day. You know, we were eating breakfast, and I'm in front of the computer with the, you know, she had made a nice little breakfast casserole, and I'm like, you know, shoveling it down. And uh, she's like, you know, we need to practice mindfulness when we eat really when we do a lot of things but at this point it was just in eating don't think about all the other things concentrate on we're eating this it's good what are my what are your taste uh, buds yeah, doing yeah what are all my senses doing my taste buds my smells and all that and um i think it's a good way to slow us to try to slow us down a little bit too mm -hmm. yes yes um yeah you know and you you brought up the the meditation and the breathing and and that happens for me too when I start meditating and I've been meditating for a long time but um when I do that um it, I I actually I go back into my childhood when I when I clear my thoughts and then I might even bring in a um, thought from my childhood and it relaxes me so much because we, we didn't have back in the 1960s there wasn't really an agenda to the day you know so you know, it was just, um, it was the freedom, the, you know, uh, the creativity that we could express yes. because we didn't have any schedules. We could just do whatever, you know? Right. Yeah. So it brings me back into that. Yeah. And then I just start deep breathing and I'm like, wow, you know, yeah. I mean, my rib cage just opens up and, and, and I love it because yeah. I know I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm getting this. You know, with the meditation, I'm getting this deep breathing, which my body is craving, yeah. you know, because we all live this busy lifestyle. I know you guys do. I yeah. do, too. Yeah. Well, and, and that uh, you bring up another good point that there is a study, I think, is more based on children that because we're overscheduled and they have so much stimulation, they never get that downtime, which is important for the creative part. And, I, you know, I try to talk about that and I've got a business podcast and I try to talk about that a lot is that even as adults we still need that mindless time to be creative and for myself uh, what that is is when I get out and go for a walk either around the neighborhood here or if I go to the gym you know it scares Terry when I come home bounding with energy because she knows I've got 25 ideals I'm fixing to throw at her. She's I'm like, ready oh, to go God. to bed. <laughs> yeah, like last night, I, yeah. I, I didn't get to the gym till late. And when I came home, I'm like, oh, my God, I got these four thoughts. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Oh. Hey. hey. Oh, my gosh. They're very, they're doing their jobs. Thank you for doing your jobs. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hey. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Oh, Hope your gosh. ears are okay. Well, we have a, we live on a a dead end street. We don't get much traffic, so when somebody doesn't heed the no outlet sign, they have to come down here and turn around. Everybody can get a little crazy. But yes. There's that's the exciting, still no outlet. That's yeah. the exciting thing about COVID, though. We got yeah. all the all those things going on for us. Too, so. Oh my goodness. Uh, Ada. Life of Zoom. It, Zoom have we have pets now. It's yeah. just the way it is. Pets and kids. Yeah, pets Zoom together. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there's one there. That's Ada. Oh my gosh. They they want to be stars. They can't stand to be left out wondering why oh we're not paying gosh. them attention for ten or fifteen minutes here. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, we're coming back for a second trip. Uh uh. So I'm totally distracted now. We, you're, we were just talking about mindfulness and going back to when we were a kid. And 
you know, I was just thinking that, um, you know, talking about the research and that even as adults to be creative, we need to take that time for ourselves and not have all that sensory overload that we're used to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we have run quite long. It's been a good conversation, and uh, we do appreciate your time very much. Uh, if you could tell us, what is a, uh, what's a tool that you use in your life, either personal, professional, that you just don't feel like you could do without? And it could be a habit, a ritual, something like that. Well, um, I think for me, my spiritual life is important. So I would say it, it's that, that meditation and prayer time that really grounds me, yeah. you know, because, because I look at my life and I know, you know, I'm not really in control and a lot of things are happening now in the world. And sometimes you just can't make sense out of them. Right. You know, you, you try, but um, there's, there's just a lot of stuff going on. So I, I, I get grounded in my spiritual life. Okay. Uh, That's awesome. Well, so Teresa, tell everybody, um, you know, how they could reach out, get a hold of you, how you could help them out either through the aging process or uh, helping a loved ones through that process. Okay, yes. And uh, my book is called um, The Art of Assisting Aging Parents. And that is on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. And I have a website and I'll just spell it out. And you have to put the www right now. It, it's not working if you don't. But yeah, www.teresa, it's T E R E S A, mer, M O E R E R, dot com. And you can find me there. And I do have my email on there if you would like to reach out to me. I do have a, a 20 minute free strategy call I have about 20 free calls a month so if you would like to have a free strategy call for 20 minutes if you have a challenge that you're facing during the caregiving um, let me know about it and I can help you do some problem solving so I love to do that and um, I do have a course um, online on my website and I basically teach you the um, my book in like six weeks so you can learn all the methods and practice. You know, I, I um, you know, recommend that you, uh, you know, have a week between each module. There's like six modules, okay. and practice these um, activities, and and then you can put it all together at the end. And um, I really think it's worth it because there's just so much, you know, overwhelm with caregiving that you might as well go into it knowing knowing what to do right. and knowing you're, yeah. And if you know you're doing everything that you can, then you can kind of walk away and say, you know, I am, I'm doing everything I can. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, and don't take any guilt with you. This is not a time to pack on a lot of guilt. Right. You just don't need to, you know, yeah. you need to have a full, happy day. <laughs> right. Exactly. Nice to be able to have a roadmap for sure. Yeah. The art of assisted mm -hmm. aging parents. That, that's such a great tool. I encourage everybody to go and check it out. Yeah. All right. Well, again, Thank Teresa, so thanks so much for your time, for coming on the show. Uh, we'll be glad to revisit with you in the future to, you know, see what's going on and, uh, we want to thank everybody for listening. You can find us, of course, at www.ageucational.com. We're also on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we'd love to, you know, start some discussions on our Facebook page. We're getting that ramped up to where, uh, you know, we can talk a lot about these things and have comments, what other people are going through, uh, what they've done for that, to, you know, try to help each other out as a community here. Uh, also, we are going to be on all the major uh, uh, podcast platforms, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Stitcher, Spotify, and uh, Pandora. I think even on uh, Amazon, a lot of places. If we're not on one where you listen, please reach out. We'd be glad to get you added. And then um, also, like I said in the beginning, we're looking for other professionals that can add value. We're looking for people to tell us their story, uh, you know, both from the caregiver and the aging perspective. So uh, reach out. We'd love to talk to you about that. So until next time, uh, take care of yourself and take care of your family. This is Roy. This is Terry. Teresa, thank you so much. We really appreciate it.
Thank you for having me. Yeah.